So what does this character do, this, this Epimetheus? He's helping Prometheus create man, and he gives fur to certain animals and claws to other animals to be able to fend for themselves, and he gives sharp teeth to certain other creatures so that they can hunt their food, you know, with their mouths, and basically gives some kind of survival advantage to every creature. But then when it comes to man, Epimetheus forgives forgets to give man any essential quality that would be able to uh, afford him, uh, you know, a survival, a survival advantage uh, that, that would be able to, you know, secure his existence on the earth. And so man is left lacking an essence. This is extremely important. The forgetfulness of Epimetheus, which is the flip side of the Promethea of Prometheus, winds up being responsible for the fact that man lacks an essence. And therefore, Prometheus enlists the aid of Athena. Humanity with its soul in the form of a butterfly. So Athena appears in the myth of Prometheus at this point, And there are many images of this. There are reliefs of it. It appears on some um, uh, seals. It's uh, on some uh, vases and, and other, you know, Greek pottery. This image of Athena coming in as Prometheus is molding mankind. And there's Epimetheus to the side who forgets to endow man with any essence. And Athena puts a butterfly into the mind. Usually it's into the head of humanity. Now, why Athena? Why does Athena help? Because Prometheus had midwifed Athena into existence. Prometheus, with his axe, had slashed open the skull of Zeus in a kind of, you know, play on a cesarean section, had split open the close-knit Pichinos, mind of Zeus. It's an incredibly important uh, image. Okay, so, so Zeus is often associated with fate. And so the Pekinos or close-knit mind of Zeus is the mesh of fate. And Prometheus slices through it with an axe, which, by the way, is a symbol of cutting through fatalism. And Prometheus delivers Athena from out of the skull of Zeus. And who is she? She's the goddess of wisdom and war. I was just going to say something. Because yeah, in, the, in the Gnostic text, you have this... You had this um, understanding of Yahweh thinks he created humans, but really he was in. A, he think somehow he had a dream, or he thought he created Adam, but really it was Sophia wisdom that did it. And she she looks at him like you don't even know. I'm the one who did all this. And then and, and but what's even crazier is that the Gnostics who get called heretics for this, they're pointing to the Bible itself and saying, no, no, no. The Book of Proverbs says that Sophia was there from the beginning. Uh, the the um the wisdom of Solomon says Sophia created the first uh, father, so like this is accurate as far as the scriptures say, not just making this stuff up. And then it lines up with what you're saying, Athena being a, a Sophia as well, and then the Titan of Wisdom, creating mankind. So even the even the Yahwists have some of their own sources right putting this stuff in there and sort of snitching on themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. So that you have the prototype for the Sophianic figure in, in Athena, who uh, is the goddess of wisdom and war. Why wisdom and war? Because you cannot gain wisdom without going to war. Mm. Because Zeus wants us ignorant. The Olympians don't want us to be wise. They are the prototype for what later become the Gnostic Archons. And so to seek wisdom is to be prepared to go to war against the gods. That's why Athena is the goddess of wisdom and war, inextricably. Okay? And so Which this is also the message of the, um, the, the Bhagavad Gita, where, 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 where Krishna is telling Arjun, you have to go to war. There's no, no, you have to make an action right now. You cannot just sit by and let your uncle do his thing. You have to fight your uncle. That's a, that's a deep thing right there. In a Greek context, it winds up being uh, epitomized by Heraclitus in the fragments of Heraclitus, um, who, who, by the way, I mean, next to Pythagoras is the first philosopher in Greek history. 
Heraclitus says, war is father and king of all. Some men, it, show, it shows, or he, he shows to be slaves. Others, uh, he, ex he reveals to be free men. Um, all things come to pass and are ordained in accordance with conflict, right? And so, look, a wisdom and war. So why does Athena help Prometheus in this situation where man is left lacking in essence on account of the forgetfulness of Epimetheus? Well, because uh, Prometheus was the midwife of Athena's birth, right. okay? And so Athena returns the favor by giving man his soul in the form of a butterfly. Now, does this, does this give man an essence? No, not really. And it's another fascinating symbol in this myth because what's a butterfly? The butterfly is the ultimate symbol of metamorphosis and transformation. Wow. So it's underlining the fact that there is no human nature. There's no human nature. Human, quote unquote, nature is to transform, to evolve, to become something else. We are beings of radical becoming. And then what's the other thing that Prometheus has to give man in order to uh, basically give him a chance to fend for himself because he doesn't have the claws that other animals do or the you know, large jaws and sharp teeth of other animals or fur so as not to freeze in the winter. Humanity, uh, humanity is gifted fire as a tool of survival, okay? So fire which is the fire of the forge, which is the, the fountainhead of all the crafts and ultimately of technological science is a remedy for the fact that we are lacking in essence. So what's this myth saying? I mean, why is it that Heidegger and Marx, who don't agree on you know, all that much, I mean, Marx is seen as the intellectual godfather of the left and Heidegger was literally a Nazi. So, you know, <laughs> there's some degree of divergence between Marx and Heidegger, but they both said Prometheus was the founder of philosophy, that Prometheus is, is the, not God, but divinity right. that inaugurates philosophy, okay? His name Why? reflects that too, forethought. Yeah, but look, it's because... Why, why do Marx and Heidegger agree? Because Marx is all about how modern industrial capitalism is going to free humanity through a revolutionary uh you know dialectic that modern industrial capitalism is going to be transformed in a way where the power of industry ultimately liberates mankind and uh the industry is reappropriated by the workers and they are no longer alienated from their labor and they ultimately become sovereign and self-determined. And then Heidegger, the focus of his philosophical project was how the trajectory of science, of, of abstract rational thought from Plato onward through Descartes ultimately culminates in modern technological science. And that, you know, uh, we have to find some way to poetically reintegrate the transformative power of modern technological science. So, you know, ultimately what Heidegger saw in the myth of Prometheus has a lot to do with the fact that fire and the butterfly were the two uh, remedies for mankind being lacking in an essence in the sense that we uniquely among all animals define our own essence. Our existence precedes our essence. And the nature of our existence is to define our own essence through the power of technology. Hmm. And to be the, basically, um, the stewards of our own evolution. So we are these butterflies that go through a process of metamorphosis from the caterpillar through the chrysalis, right, to ultimately becoming this uh, creature. It's kind of like what Nietzsche's getting at with the rope and the Superman thing. Exactly, exactly. It is the first version of that um, symbol or metaphor that ultimately becomes Nietzsche's tightrope between ape and overman. And I, know, and I also noticed that all of the 
ancient Greek mysteries, um, all the great myths, basically. There's usually some sort of metamorphosis involved with the hero, with the savior, with the messiah, whoever it is. They all have some sort of apotheosis, metamorphosis, some sort of resurrection, something like that, which makes it a standard mystic mysteries, I guess you would say, initiation cult or something like that. They have that. That's the common thread between all of them. You know what I mean? Sure, I do know what you mean. But the thing is that um, the Olympian world order is predicated on the stasis of humanity. And so to the extent that there are, you know, hero, by the way, originally it means hybrid. It means hero means it comes from the word eros and with reference to the eros or sex between gods and mortals. Hmm. And so the original heroes were the people who were sired by the quote unquote fallen angels. Right. Uh, and were more than mere humans and who actually had a rebellious nature and defied the, the will of heaven. Right. And so to the extent that you have these heroes engaging in developmental trajectories and a building up of their character and persona and developing an ethos and becoming basically men in their own right, you have a defiance of what Olympus wants, which is us to basically remain servile, you know, and submit, for, huh? submit to submit. Yeah, that's it. And, yeah, and not, and, and not undergo character building, right, which is right. going to give us enough... Uh, psychological and ethical independence to, to determine our own course in the future. So anyway, you have at the core of this myth of the creation of mankind, an emphasis of the fact that our existence precedes our essence and that through the power of technological science, we are going to undergo various metamorphoses that ultimately hold the potential for us to become as powerful or more powerful than the gods. And so this is, you know, a, another element of the, the uh, adversarial character of Prometheus. And then you see this continue in his next act of trickery. So Prometheus is not only a trickster because he steals fire from the workshop of Hephaestus and brings it as a gift to mankind. Prometheus is also a trickster because when Zeus comes around after the creation of you know, hum humanity, not too happy with how humanity has been created, and wanting to reduce humanity to servility, uh, Zeus says to Prometheus, well, now that you created these things, which, you know, I'm not very happy with, you know, how, how you did this. I don't know about this butterfly business, right? <laughs> uh, I want you to decide how they're going to sacrifice to me, right? right? How are these, these uh, creatures going to be brought to, to their knees and, uh, you know, basically worship and revere me? And so Prometheus devised this devises this machination where he presents Zeus with two forms of sacrifice and asks him to choose between them. And in one of them, he's basically taken all of the nourishing lean meat from an animal, from a sacrificed animal, and stuffed it into the stomach of an ox, which is very visually displeasing. And in the other bowl is... Uh, the bones, the white bones of the sacrificed animal, but covered with a veneer of marbled fat. And Zeus picks the marbled fat, not realizing that it's all bones underneath. And this means that man gets to keep the nourishing part of the sacrificed animal and is basically giving nothing of importance to Olympus. So this is another way in which we see that Prometheus does not want his children to be, you know, a servile race revering some gods above themselves. Prometheus is trying to, you know, basically um, ensure that the, the nourishing uh, part of the sacrifice remains the uh, allotment of human beings. Right. And, and this is another act of tr trickery that he engages in, uh, which, by the way, portrays Zeus as a fool, uh, because, I mean, how do you, what kind of God, you don't realize, like, he's pulling a fast one on you like this, and Hesiod tries to cover this up. Now, Hesiod, when he writes the Theogony, in particular, the, he, he, write, he mentions the myth of Prometheus in both of his major works, in Works and Days right. and in Theogony. And it's interesting that when you read Works and Days, Prometheus has a little bit more autonomy, and his defiance of Zeus is a, a little bolder 
Mm -hmm. uh, but then when he writes Theogony, Hesiod is really trying to come up with a canon of Olympian religion, right? right? This Hesiod character um, is an epitome of Greek traditionalism, Absolutely. patriarchy, conservatism, misogyny. He hates women, okay? And so when he writes Theogony, he says absurd things like, oh, well, you know, Zeus knew that uh, Prometheus was trying to pull a fast one on him and he just, you know, picked uh, uh, the, the bowl of bones covered with the fat to like lure Prometheus into committing some sin of defiance or something. Right. And he's making justifications to whitewash the vulnerabilities of Zeus because he's helping to build a cult of total obedience to Olympus. Uh, but then later, you have Aeschylus about 50, 50, 60 years later or something, some, somewhere around there, the next century. He, he see it as in the 600s BC. Aeschylus is in the 500s BC. Uh, by the time Aeschylus turns Prometheus into the first figure of Greek tragedy, you see the more um, humanist and rebellious uh, elements of the myth yeah. being, uh, you know, basically uh, restored to what was probably their original form. And I noticed in that, in this particular version with Asclus, I want, Asclus, Asclus is very fascinating because I know he's initiated in all these mysteries. He gets in trouble. He almost gets killed for spilling the beans of what these mysteries are. But anyways, before we even get to that, I noticed that in that text, he really has this long dialogue between Hermes, who's sort of a tempter, He's the mouth word. He's the logos of Zeus. He's the word. He's the he's a messenger of Zeus, basically. Zeus is won't see him. He's like, why can't Zeus come himself? And I and I noticed that Prometheus is like antagonizing him, and Hermes is tempting him. Oh, we'll, we'll let you go. Just you know, just bend the knee. Just bend the knee. And and Prometheus, Prometheus refuses to cave into the tempter. What is this about? He's the angel Gabriel. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. Hermes is who later becomes Jibrael, you know, or the angel Gabriel. Who oh, that makes a lot of sense. Brings the Quran to Muhammad, you know, and so on and so forth. And um, so this, this uh, messenger of God, uh, the announcer, um, comes and basically, or Thoth, you know, comes and basically, he, he tries to, okay, He's not just tempting uh, uh, Prometheus. He's trying to torture a secret from out of him. Because when Prometheus is bound by Zeus, it's not just a punishment. It is a torture that's intended to break Prometheus so that he reveals the secret of who is going to overthrow Zeus. Prometheus, with his forethought, and by the way, the mother of Prometheus is famous, not to be confused with Thetis, who we're going to talk about momentarily, yeah. but Thamus, um, uh, the, the Titaness, is the mother of Prometheus, and she was the creator of the Oracle of Delphi, which she later gives to Apollo. So the prophetic power that's associated with the Oracle of Delphi is also somehow um, implicit in the myth of Prometheus, uh, because Thamus, the creator of the Oracle of Delphi, is the mother of Prometheus. So, so anyway, Prometheus, with his prophetic power and his forethought, the kind of forethought and uh, projection that also becomes instrumental to technological science, right? Technological science is all about projection. And so Prometheus, with his power of projection, his forethought, and his prophecy, knows who is going to eventually overthrow Zeus. And it turns out that it is uh, the soul who later winds up being born as Achilles. And what Prometheus knows is that Zeus is going to rape Thamus. You know, Zeus is a serial rapist. He just turns into all these various animals and goes down and basically rapes these women, these, these poor women. Uh, and Prometheus knows that one of these women is going to be famous, and so Achilles is going to be born as a a proper hero, a hero in the old sense of a hybrid. He's going to be a demigod. 
And this demigod version of Achilles is going to lead humanity into rebellion and overthrow Zeus and uh, be a new sovereign over humanity, a much more beneficent, much more humanitarian um, ruler from the, the throne of Olympus. And later what winds up happening is that actually Zeus finds out that this is uh, going to happen. And so um, Zeus has, uh, or Zeus basically pulls back and lets Themis be married to Peleus, who becomes the human mortal father of Achilles. And then we have the whole story of Achilles and the Iliad, right? right? right. Uh, so, so, but this Achilles was supposed to be born as a demigod and Prometheus knows this and he wants to torture this out of, uh, I mean, yeah, Prometheus, Zeus wants to torture this out of Prometheus. And so he keeps sending Hermes. He keeps sending Hermes to try to, you know, convince Prometheus to give up this secret. While we're on this, though, let me point out why, why is it significant that it's Achilles? And by the way, I discussed this at length in Prometheus and Atlas. This is, you know, the devil's really in the details here. And I go into the Iliad and its connection to this part of the myth of Prometheus um, in my chapter on Prometheus in Prometheus and Atlas. If you look at the character of Achilles and the Iliad, his conflict with Agamemnon and the defiant stance that he takes amidst the Trojan War shows you the first figure in Greek literature who is questioning the social order. In archaic Greece, there was no conceptual distinction between social order and nature. Hmm. Nature was framed as a concept by the early philosophers who are writing about 150 years at least after the Iliad, at least. In the time of the Iliad, in the time of quote unquote Homer, whether there was actually a Homer who wrote this or whether he was a bard who later recited it, whatever. In the time of quote unquote Homer, there was no conceptual distinction yet between nature and the nature of things in society. It was believed that customs were God given the way that, you know, the, the seasons are God given, the way that the habits of animals are God given. Social institutions are just the way things are, and they can't be questioned any more than, you know, the way the birds and the bees live on, right? It's all just the way things inevitably have to be right and so when you see achilles in the iliad basically call bullshit on agamemnon and confront him as an unjust tyrannical ruler and a bad commander and stand up for himself pridefully some would say with hubris the kind of hubris that we see from prometheus mm. ultimately right you are seeing the first questioning of the social order and an implicit framing of the concept of justice. Wow. As opposed to the way things just are. So Achilles is saying, sorry, fuck that. Things shouldn't be this way. They should be some other way. Right. And this is the kernel of the idea of utopia right here in the figure of Achilles. So what's being said in the myth of Prometheus, where Prometheus knows that it's Achilles who's going to overthrow Zeus, if he's allowed to be born as a demigod, is that there's a connection being made back to the story of the Iliad mm. and to the first framing of a just order as opposed to the de facto order of the world. The first aspiration for utopia. That is also uh, part and parcel of this part of the Prometheus myth. It's the birth of progressivism. And I just thought of something. There's an epigram in the first century I think during the time of Vespasian or Domitian or something like that, Marshall was the author. And he says that he has a, a, a quick little hymn or epigram, I guess they're called, where he says, Prometheus, just as Prometheus is bound to the Scythian cliff, nourish the constant bird with the glut of his stomach. So did Laurelus, hanging from a cross that was no stage prop, offered up his uncovered trials to the Caledonian bear. And I noticed that there's this, because this is somebody who's um, who's inspired by the uh, Epicureans and the Naturalists and the Stoics, and he's looking at Prometheus as an example, this great example of sacrificing yourself 
for the good, for the for the progress of the world. And I, I, I got, and that brings us to like Christianity. Are they trying to do something similar to this with Jesus? I think so. Yes, although it's a perversion of it, and we'll come right. to that. But and notice also in this quote, the Scythian peaks. Right. So yet again, the Greek, the Greeks knew that the place where Prometheus was bound was Scythian territory. And this connects again back to the myth of Amirani and how, you know, there's an awareness here that somehow this Prometheus myth has Scythian origins. Right. At least one of its one of its um, vectors is Scythian. The other one is the myth of Enki and probably were fused in the Persian Empire. So speaking of the Persian Empire, we're talking about Aeschylus. And Aeschylus, uh, you know, he's famous as a, as a poetic playwright and really as the founder of drama in, you know, in its current form, um, before uh, Aeschylus, there was only a single bard reciting a poem on a stage. And it's Aeschylus who introduced other characters and created a drama where there's multiple perspectives, right? And uh, this is, again, this is not where I was about to go, but, you know, again, we need to pause and just uh, reflect on this for a minute. Yeah. Uh, but just, just contemplate what a transformation of human consciousness that is. And again, this is something I go into in, in, at length in Prometheus and Atlas. Before Aeschylus, you had a bard who was basically reciting an ancestral tradition. And you only had that bard's perspective. And moreover, the bard did not insert himself into the poem uh, so as to, you know, interject any commentary on it, right? You're just having a person acting as a medium for the transmission of ancestral tradition. Aeschylus invents this thing, which we call drama in retrospect, where there's multiple characters and they each have their own perspective. So think about this. You, what effect does this have on people's consciousness where they're watching a stage play where for the first time they're getting multiple characters with different divergent perspectives, each of which the audience member could choose to identify with and to flip between these divergent perspectives. And moreover, the setting for this uh, drama with multiple characters in it is an amphitheater where literally there's multiple perspectives on the drama, right? Uh, depending on where you're sitting in the amphitheater on any given night, you know, during, during the many times that you go to see a stage play, you will have one or another varying perspective on the drama. So there's the, the perspectival shift between the various characters and then the perspectival shift in terms of geometry, uh, pers you know, um, perceptual geometry of the audience member sitting in an amphitheater. And lo and behold, this is the moment when we go from really stiff Egyptian style sculptures in Greece to photorealistic three-dimensional sculptures in Greece, mm. okay, with that extremely, uh, you know, true to life, high precision that classical Greek sculptures are famous for. Right. You think that just happened by accident? No, what happened? Because you had uh, sculptors who were sitting there in amphitheaters watching stage plays from varying perspectives on different night, different evenings. And they discovered perspective, mm. both geometric perspective and also psychological perspective by flipping between the viewpoints of different characters in a drama. Aeschylus is responsible for this. And which is the first of the dramas that Aeschylus composed? Who is the first figure of tragedy? Prometheus. Right. 